Good morning. We are at London with Sir Ranulph Gens, a famous British explorer who uh, went through the poles uh, unsupported uh, because the Norwegians were trying to do it first, right? Correct. <laughs> now let us uh, tell us a, a bit about it because it was a tremendous feat of uh, not only endurance but also uh, intelligence about the planning. So it, it took a very long time. Uh, the planning took seven years full-time work and nobody was paying my wife and me and nobody was paying the volunteers from nine mm -hmm. countries who came to join us. Um, and we had 1,900 sponsor companies. It takes a, a long time to get. Uh, from um, Norway we had a ship, 40-year-old ship, mm -hmm. and we had to have a uh, expensive ski plane for four years. And we, eventually, after six years, I found a company to let us borrow the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. We never fly, but parachutes for resupply All right. are, are necessary. And yeah, it took seven years to plan, three years from when we start to when we finish, Mm -hmm. And then after we come back, two years to pay back money to people. <laughs> so if that had failed, mm -hmm. we would have wasted, my wife and me, 20 years of our lives. All right. Yeah. Talk about compromise. So we were lucky that it didn't fail. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, what has been the driving force of these 40 years of um, exploration and adventures all through it? Because, I mean, you've been through feats of... Uh, unbearable pain, to be honest. I mean, some of your pictures are unbelievable. Well, the driving force, you could say, was my late wife. Um, she had the ideas, mm -hmm. and another driving force, which only became apparent later, mm -hmm. was the competition. Okay. Because a world record can only be broken once, mm -hmm. and historically, the British people had tried, I was brought up in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, the British people had tried for 300 years to be first before the Dutch and the Americans and the Spanish and, uh, in order to find the Northeast Passage mm -hmm. to the riches of India and so many many British Navy people died mm -hmm. in the ice mm -hmm. and then they tried getting first to the North Pole mm -hmm. in 1900 but although they lost more people than anyone else dead, they did not get to the North Pole first. The Ameri American Admiral Peary claimed first to North Pole. And two years later, when the British were trying to get to Antarctica, to the South Pole, mm -hmm. again, they did more pioneering and they were the first people into Antarctica. But suddenly, the Norwegians come <laughs> and they're not scientific, they're just racing. Yeah. And they get to South Pole. So, 40 years later, when our generation come along, mm. we decide that okay, Americans first North Pole, Norwegians first South Pole. Who is going to be first to go round the entire polar <laughs> circumference for 52,000 miles with no flying, crossing Antarctic, crossing the Arctic, not just getting to the pole, mm. but crossing the ice caps? So my wife uh, started with this idea mm -hmm. in 1972 and on 1979 our ship left uh, London um, with Prince Charles and 25,000 people saying goodbye <laughs> and we come back three years later having done the first and only journey vertically around Earth surface. It's never been done again by any route and it become more difficult because of climate change in the north. Um, so that one, what is behind it? Competition and also, if you want to be a bit more um, grounded, we didn't have another way of making an income. Um, so we, we thought if we do this and after, if it's successful, we can write books, we can give talks at conferences. Lovely books at conference, may I say. Well, that's very kind. So that is what we um, were motivated. That's right. And last but not least, uh, when you, when we look back at the history of polar exploration, the Atmundsen versus uh, <coughs> Scott is always a classic. And uh, let's see, the traditional view was that Munson was smart and tough, and Scott was uh, tougher but not as smart. However, you were kind of vindicating the heritage of Scott. Would you like to point out something on that? Well. Scott did not go down there to race anybody. 
if, if he comes to the poll in his own time, he will, on the way to the poll, stop and, and make maps of where he was going. He will collect fossils to find out about the continent. He will not just race. I mean, when Amundsen went there, he took the world's top skiers and the, the best racing dogs. When Scott went down there, he took the top scientists. He had one Norwegian to teach them how a ski works. You know, they were useless at going quickly, but they didn't want to. So the results of Amundsen's race was that they won the race to the pole. The end result of Scott's two expeditions down there, including when he died, was to produce more scientific information about the new continent. He discovered that it was a continent, not floating ice, than all the other international expeditions of the first half of the 20th century. That is what Scott did. Now, with modern media, oh, we'll win the race, we'll win the race. <laughs> it means nothing. Amundsen did not even leave a map of his route. Mm -hmm. And he had amazing luck, because when he arrived down there, mm -hmm. he camped at a place which subsequently, a year later or so, broke off. And he, right. he, he, he ran into good weather. Scots mm -hmm. people ran into bad weather. That is luck, it's not planning. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that scientifically, everything is slow. Mm -hmm. But, as I say, the scientific results of Scott's group and the ones that did not die became director of metrology in the UK and all over the place. They were true scientists, so they couldn't be expected to race. I see. Well, thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>